Hi everyone, my name is Samir. I am the director of is at Comsa. Hopefully you can hear me. Uh, we have today three physicians with us and one more waiting to join in. Sorry for the delay, we had some technical issues. Uh, so the way we're going to do this is we'll be going through the physicians that we have with us and then from there we will be going into uh, the questions right away. Uh, the physicians have had a chance to look at the questions, so hopefully uh, this will be useful. So again, why don't we start with Dennis, the Dr. Fiddler, um, and then we'll go to Lucas and Ravi. Go ahead, um, Dr. So Fiddler. Sure, so my name is Dennis Fiddler. Uh, I did my residency training in uh, Barrie, Ontario in family medicine. I just finished that last year, and now I'm doing uh, emergency medicine in uh, Actually, three different options. Okay, and uh, Lucas, how about yourself? Okay, so my name is Lucas Krajewski, and I just graduated from MSU COM, and I matched to Queen's University for family medicine. Congratulations, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. That's awesome. And Ravi, how about yourself? Uh, so I'm Ravi Upal. Uh, I went to Nova Southeastern in Florida. Um, and I matched uh, pediatrics in uh, Long Island, New York. And uh, Rav, you, you're doing a, a duly accredited residency with an H-1B visa, right? Uh, yeah. Okay, so that's cool. And then we're also still waiting on Dr. Amit Singh. He's going to be the, he is doing internal medicine at St. Louis University. Um, he's also on an H-1B, and he's also the physician who is meeting up um, pre-meds, MS1s, anyone really who wants to meet up and have a chat with him at Heartland Center on June 8th at 8 p.m. The link for that is on our Facebook page, so if you're interested in that, please go check that out. So um, as all of you have already had a chance to look at the questions, why don't we just jump right into it? And the first question, I'll read it out. It, is it imperative to rotate in Canada to match in Canada? How do you go about setting these up? Uh, Lucas, since you matched into Canada, I suppose this is one that you, uh, would fit right in your alley. Sure. So I can I can try to answer that. So the way I did it is I actually rotated in Canada. I did about four and a half months of rotations uh, in uh, internal medicine, uh, geriatrics, family. Uh, I think uh, you know definitely having Canadian experience is important when you're applying for residency because it gives you an opportunity to also obtain a reference letter, which I think will go. Um, a long way in helping you secure a position. When uh, I applied, I uh, made sure that all of my letters were Canadian letters, and that just kind of worked out for me because I had enough uh, rotations in Canada to be able to get at least three letters. So I think, uh, you know, it is important to be able to rotate in Canada. I don't think you really need to rotate as long as I did, for example. Uh, I've met residents who've rotated only two weeks, for example, and still were able to match into Canada. But I think some experience would definitely be beneficial. Okay. And uh, Dr. Fiddler, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I totally agree. Uh, you definitely need to have some rotation experience inside of Canada. If not, uh, when I was doing mine, I did a lot of Canada. I was in Canada. Uh, that lots of uh, doctors, but it was just uh, a little bit we don't need explicitly only Canadian uh, rotation. You just get up here and if you have a chance to get a reference letter, that will uh, help you along the way. Okay. And okay, so we'll go to the next one. If we were a, if we were to do resi our residency in the U.S. and wanted to come back to Canada down the line to work, is that possible? If yes, how hard is it, and what's the procedure like? I have been told by deals in Ontario that there's no additional testing and I've had this confirmed by the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario. So uh, I guess anybody can, whoever wants to take that question can go for it. Um, so yeah, so the short answer is uh, yes you can, but you have to make sure your residency training in the United States is equivalent in length to the training that is required in Canada. So that's very specialty dependent. Um, so, like, uh, for certain ones, like uh, emergency medicine, I believe you need four years in Canada, where a lot of the programs in the United States are three years. So you'd have to do, like, a fellowship year or something like that to make it equivalent. Um, so 
again, the best way would be to contact the specific uh, board in your province for whichever residency you're interested in, and making sure that if you were to do your residency in the United States, it would meet that requirements. And then what specific uh, board licensing exam in your specialty you would need to practice in that province. Okay. And uh, Amit, did you want to add anything? No, not really. He's pretty much nailed the hammer on the head. You got to pretty much be equal. Be be equal. That's about it. Like that's the only like net like challenge. And then I don't know what it's like to actually get a job. Like that's something that I kind of want to find out about. Like, is there a bias or something like that? Maybe Dr. Fiddler could help us with that answer there. Just to elaborate on uh, what Ravi was saying, uh, it's actually year specific and cost specific. If you go to the Royal College. Dr. Could you hold the mic closer to your uh, to yourself if you could? Sure. Uh, is it better? Yeah. It's not, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's not only year specific, it's actually uh, month specific in that you actually have to. Uh, specific months of rotations that are uh, for the Royal College in Canada. There's a great website uh, that actually goes through per specialty. What you require per month. Try and get your uh, standards filled so that when you come back and back to Canada. Bias. There is a little bit of a bias. I can't lie. My cousin had an issue uh, coming back a little bit from having a bias. Uh, she was a neurology resident, completed her training, worked in the state for I think a year and a half. She's coming back to Canada because of the video, but she's been solidified, has not had any issues at all. She's working fully on license under her. Okay. Thank you. Next question now How competitive is it? to obtain an OBGYN residency yes, on an H1B, and since the years of residency training between Canada and the U.S. for OBGYN, how do you obtain a licensure to practice in Canada? How about the OBGYN residency specifically? Um, Ravi, did you want to say something? Um, so, like, I can't say in, you know, too much specifics about ob -GYN. I can just say, for, like, for my school, I know this year, even for the Americans, ob -GYN seems to be uh, on the uprise in terms of competitive, competitiveness. Um, I don't know how easy it is to get H-1B, but it, it's become a more competitive residency. And so imagine any, any residency, if it's already competitive, it adds another layer of competitiveness if you're trying to get a H-1B visa for that. Um, most of the programs are ACG and you know, and they're bigger academic programs, so that might help. But um, again, I I don't think anyone's matched OB UN in recent years from Canada. So I just say. Um. So my two cents on this OB issue. So basically, the idea is whoever this applicant is, they should go on the AMA website, the Frida website, and actually see what your chances are, because. You can sort out by the amount of the H-1B spots there are. At least that way you'll have like um, kind of at least an amount of residencies you can apply to. So if there's like 50 of them. There's a pretty good chance you'll actually get uh, you'll actually get interviews and gets and might get a spot per se, depending on your application again. And then um, in regards to is it equal in length? That you can find out quite easily on the statement of need website because the idea is like if you need a fellowship in order. For you to be equivalent to Canada, it'll tell you on that website, uh, like pretty blatantly, obviously. So that's the, to whoever the applicant is applying to OB guy. I think that would be the best way to go. How easy is it to get an H1B? H1Bs aren't the easiest things to get, of course. You know, like the more competitive specialty, the less chances you have of getting it. It all comes down to what an app, what kind of an applicant you are. If you're a competitive applicant, everyone's going to want you, kind of an idea. So that's kind of my two cents on the issue, at least. Okay, thank you guys for answering that question. Uh, just want to remind everyone uh, who is watching, if you do want to ask any follow-up questions or have any additional questions, you can type them on in the, uh, the live chat. We all do have one right now. 
And the question is about J-1 visas. They're saying there are some programs that will only give J-1. What do most people do during the two years where you have to come back to Canada? Have an answer to that? So essentially, what do people do in the two years? Uh, when you do a J-1 visa, you're, you're mandated to return to your the home country for two years. Um, do any of you know anybody who was in that position and uh, what did they do in during those two years that they had to leave the U.S. and come back to Canada? Um, so with the J-1, you can get a waiver if you work in an underserved area. Um, so you don't necessarily have to go back to your home country. So I know that I've, uh, I've known physicians from even other countries who have done that where they've worked at an underserved area. Um, and then I don't know if Dennis has some insight into what they would do in Canada. So the problem is, is that when you actually get to Canada, uh, or when the day one it expires and you're required to come back to Canada, you cannot work. You don't have full licensure, you can't actually uh, work because of that. So you actually have to take it with it. And then people who get stuck doing that, I know people from other countries who come back to Canada get stuck. Um, so for me, so um, I, was, I was applying internal medicine, and I was worried, hey, well, what happens if I was to get the J-1 visa? So the idea is um, I would be like Ravi. I would go ahead and go for the waiver. So I, I asked one of the physician recruiters, like, hey, how hard is it to actually get a waiver job? It's actually not so bad. It's just a little bit rural. It's kind of what you have to be willing to sacrifice. So, so like I guess a majority of Canadians, I think their option would be to go down the waiver route and not really – kind of come home per se, even though you kind of sign a document saying you are going to come home. So just a little caveat there for you guys. And, uh, I, you know, um, just something to add, I think there are more waivers uh, per state for areas of primary care and probably internal medicine. But if you were to go into a specialty um, and there are very few J ones for those already, then you would have a tougher, tougher time finding a waiver position as there are far fewer of them. Am I right? Uh, that's exactly correct. Yes, you kind of want to be in a in a primary care specialty to in order to get one because that's kind of what's needed out in these rural areas. The specialists are very concentrated towards academic centers, so they have tons of those. So you kind of want to be more into like a primary care specialty. And primary care is just not family practice and internal medicine. It also goes down to OB and assign some ER spots actually. So just and pediatrics for sure and psych. So it's quite a few specialties. Just not you're not limited. To family and I am so I kind of want to make that clear to everyone so don't be worried like hey I'm only going to be a family practice doctor or an internal medicine doctor oh no there's still quite a bit left there for you as well perfect thank you guys for uh, for that we'll go on to the next question um, since for Canada you need to do four years of I am to be certified and we'll be doing three years of I am plus three years any subspecial Will doing three years of IM and three years of subspecialty training in the U.S. meet those requirements? So I'm assuming this person is asking if they do a fellowship in the U.S., can they come, can go back to Canada and practice under that fellowship? So to my understanding, yes, you should be able to go back and practice general internal medicine after your three after your three year IM fellowship and I mean, three year IM residency and three year fellowship because the idea is. You just need a four-year residency program to come practice internal medicine. Now, is that in your advantage is a different question. You've, you've done six years. Why would you want to take a massive pay cut and then practice internal medicine in Canada, per se? So that's kind of what you have to think about. If you really want to come back into in Canada at the end of the day, what you do is you do your three-year internal medicine residency and then do the one-year fellowship in palliative medicine or whatever is a one-year fellowship is. That way, you're not going to take a massive pay cut, per se, when you do do that. Um, anything I might have missed? Yeah, it, it just comes with the actual months that you require to get into the IM certification inside of the Royal College. You need that one year to solidify those locations that you're lacking on and come back. So besides that, absolutely right. Thank you. Um, so the next question is really, what is the importance of research and did, did, did it help you in obtaining your residency? So did any of you guys do research? And if, if so, how do you think it helped you? Um, and if you didn't, then, 
you know, do you think it would have helped you, I suppose? Um, so research, it depends on the specialty and the type of residency programs you're applying for. So uh, in general, if you're doing, you know, one of the more primary care specialties, they don't have as much emphasis on research. However, if you're trying to do, you know, I am at a big academic center, they might really, and they're, you know, really research oriented, then yeah, research would be in your benefit. Any of the more competitive specialties, of course, they want research in their field, derm, opto, uh, urology, things like that. Um, and so, yeah, it just really depends on the institution and the type of residence you're going for. I had uh, like bench research experience and like case presentations here and there. Those are always helpful. You have something to put on your CV, something to talk about at your interview, but it's not like an absolute important for most of the primary care specialties and community programs. And I think we have some questions coming up ahead about uh, extracurriculars. Um, would, would you say that's, you know, that's alongside the same, would you say you have the same message with that, for extracurriculars with that, uh, alongside research? Um, so like extracurriculars, just have something. You want something that you're able to show you've been doing besides just medicine for, you know, your time throughout medical school. You want something to talk about your interviews. Um, so that could be community service. It could be uh, research, it can be leadership, it can be any sorts of other product, uh, projects, public health, anything like that. You just need to show them you're doing other things besides just studying and going on your rotations. Um, so I also had some research. I did, uh, I did some research and I think, so I think the reason here I did research was because I wanted to go to an academic program. So the idea is I got this piece of advice from a program director. It's like, hey, if you want to go to an MD program, try and look, at, try and look as much as an MD. So they generally do a lot of, they generally do research and things like that. So I was like, hey, so that's why I think research is important. So now is it mandatory is a different question. It's not really mandatory per se. It just might help you score a couple more points on your interview or like little list they have, you know. But it might not be worth that much, but hey, every point kind of helps. When they're trying to rank like 100 applicants or like 1,000 applicants, it kind of helps you, push you, pushes you towards the top a little bit. So that's why I recommend do definitely doing research. If you have access to it, why not? If you like, if you have to go, if you completely hate research, I mean, with a passion, then don't do it. It's not a problem. Uh, did it help me? Um, is a good question. I think it kind of did actually, because it kind of gave uh, gave my interviewer something to talk to me about. It gave like a little focal point of like something to talk about between the both of us. Uh, same thing with extracurricular activities. You kind of don't want to have a, an empty application. It looks kind of bad on your on your end, kind of a thing. If you have an empty application, it's like, hey. I have a 4.0 GPA, but I really didn't do anything. You know, it doesn't really look that great. But if you have like, hey, I have a 3.2 GPA, but I did all these cool things, then people will be like, oh, okay, yeah, that's, this guy's a cool person. Just, you're a more a well-rounded applicant. I remember when we were applying for med school, this thing about being a well-rounded applicant kept coming up. It's the same scenario all over again, kind of an idea. Because people, you gotta remember like, whenever they're interviewing you for residency, they want someone that they can work with for three hours. I'm, uh, they can work with for three years, right? Because you got to remember, like, when you're in residence, you'll be working 60 to 80 hours a week, and they want to be able to have someone like, that has a personality, you know? Someone that's been out there and volunteered and know what it feels like to be a patient and things like that. So that's why I feel like extracurriculars are important, but they, and they also help ground your interview as well. So whenever, like, they'll be like, oh, hey, how was volunteering for the homeless shelter like, you know? It kind of gives you something to talk about for your 15 minutes with your interviewer. So, yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Okay. Now, our next question is kind of a two-part question, and it's simply any general advice that you have uh, for people who want to specifically get an H-1B visa or match into Canada. Why don't we start with Lucas? Um, mm -hmm. Lucas, do you have any general advice for people who want to match back into Canada? I think the most important thing is to be aware of your timelines. When you have to do which exam, um, because they, they tend to come up quite quickly. And so if you miss a timeline, then you're basically out of the running very early on. Uh, so I would say that would be one. Um, if you can get rotations in Canada, I think that'll, that'll uh, help your application as well. If you can get Canadian reference letters, of course, like I mentioned earlier. And then, like it was mentioned just earlier, being a well-rounded applicant, someone who has some extracurricular activities, 
has a good board scores. Um, you know, I've had a little bit of research uh, prior to, to, to med school, but not anything specific in medical school. Wasn't really mentioned, wasn't really asked about during the interviews, at least for family medicine. Um, so, so I think that's, that's kind of the general advice I would give. Um, plan early, and, um, and, and I think that's probably it, yeah. Okay, thanks so much, Lucas. And um, Amit and Ravi, do you have any general advice on, since both of you got H-1Bs, any general advice on uh, how to make yourself an excellent candidate for an H-1B program and looking for those H-1B programs? Why don't we start with you, Ravi? Okay, um, so for H-1B programs, first of all, you need to find programs that are willing to do it, and especially if they have done it in the past. Um, so they have more experience with it. A lot of programs will shy away from wanting to do H-1Bs because J-1Bs are easier for them. It's less expensive for them. Um, and there's like, you know, less hassles and things with that. So uh, you really need to make sure these programs are like on board with doing an H-1B. Um, and so it took a lot of emailing them, calling, talking to them, following up with them. Um, and uh, that's when I found programs that were – They've done H-1Bs in the past, or they're, they seem like they knew what they were doing, or other departments within their hospitals done H-1B. I scheduled uh, electives at those institutions because they had the higher probability of actually giving me an H-1B. And then uh, just, you know, again, maintaining those contacts, uh, working hard on those uh, auditions, and showing them, you know, that I'm worth the investment to spend the extra couple thousand dollars to sponsor me for a visa. Um, and so you just you gotta show them that you're worth it. Um, and so most of the programs are gonna be ACGME programs. They're gonna be the bigger the bigger centers. Um, uh, the My Place happens to be a smaller program actually, but they, they did H1B last year for a uh, resident. So it worked out for me, but uh, that's like the main advice. Um, so you kind of don't really seek out an H-1B. You kind of have like a list to choose from. Like it's going to come down to the programs that offer it. There's people, because the idea is H-1B isn't like program dependent. It's institutional dependent. So like let's just say um, University of Kansas, like it's not, it's not based on internal medicine or surgery. They can't, it's one blanket statement from like the GME department saying we don't do H-1Bs. So now, if you, first you're going to do is you're going to make a list of all the H-1B programs you apply to. Then as Ravi did, you go ahead and audition in as many as you can because at the end of the day, they kind of want to see what they're hiring. If they get a preview of it, that's, that's the creme de la creme of it, of course. Then if for, you can audition every single one of them. So what I suggest, have a good, good set of board scores behind you and some research and like any, anything you can do to make the application quote unquote perfect is is always to your favor per se. So that's kind of like the general advice. Auditioning I think is very, very helpful. If you audition at a place, they kind of get to test run you, see what you're like, do you fit in the program, kind of an idea. Um, also though, a little bit of a danger I want to advise people though, just because it's an H1B program doesn't mean the program's good for you though. So just because a program could be in Waco, Texas, or something like that, you know? You don't know where Waco, Texas is. I'm like, what Waco, Texas has to offer for you? So make sure when you apply to this program in Waco, Texas, it's actually a program that you kind of want to go to. Because you don't want to get stuck somewhere where you don't want to be there, you know? If Waco, Texas isn't for you, it's not for you, you know? Like, no matter how good the visa is, you're stuck there. So just be careful about that. It's a big caveat. Because I know there were a couple programs that when I went to interview, I was like, oh, God, I hope I don't end up here just because of the visa, you know? So I really want I really want to like drive that home to, to future applicants. That you, you guys both made an ex excellent point with regards to that. Now our next question has to do with now that you are starting residency and will have some sort of income, can you explain your financial plans to pay off student loans? Take that out. No? <laughs> student <laughs> Student loans. Dr. Fitter, what did you, um, did you have student loans and what did you do to tackle them while you were a resident? So I had two different types of student loans. I had student loans from Canada and I was a U.S. citizen as well, so I had U.S. loans as well. Uh, so 
because I have a um, I basically made a call with Canadian funds where the Canadian dollar died last year that stock. Uh, and then basically uh, just started paying off a little bit every single month. I think I did one of their uh, the graduate programs where they slowly increased over time, uh, where they would just, you know, I would just take so much out of whatever I made per month and put it towards my loan. You don't have to go crazy with it. You can live as you can live like a medicine to store resident. You can, you know, specify what you have and put everything else towards your loan. I had I had no issue doing that. You still live quite well. Uh, but I'll tell you that when you get out, we'll have uh, money to actually pay off the loan. So don't be so worried about it when you're in residency itself. You will have to sign in the future to pay it off and you will lose it. So I wouldn't worry about it so much. Okay, so basically what I got from that was uh, essentially don't be too worried about your student loans. Try, you, try to make the payments that you can make, but it's, it shouldn't be a, a stressor. There's not much, and I think if you're doing residency in the U.S., the average salary is anywhere between 50 uh, to 60,000. There's not much that you're going to be able to do um, especially, you know, to be able to pay that off or make any dents. So uh, it's not something that should be at the forefront. You really want to be doing the best that you can in your intern year and set yourself up uh, for success in the future. So, uh, so I kinda, let me just jump in here real quick. So I just want to echo everything you guys kind of said. I just did the research on this because currently right now in your residency, you can kind of use your interest as, uh, as a tax shield. So you kind of want to hang on to that as long as you can. Up until up until you start making past $75,000, you can use that as a tax shield. So that's kind of what I plan on doing, just shielding as lot. Because like after, because you make like 51000ish in residency as an intern, after taxes, that kind of falls under 38000 So you kind of need every penny of that you're going to get in residency in order to kind of live, you know. Like you can only live so long as a student. You kind of got to move up a little bit sometimes. So that's kind of my thought process. I'm going to use it as a shield for a little bit. And then when I become an attending, that's when I'll start, like, I'll start shoveling up this debt. That's kind of my game plan, per se. So, now, um, uh, so you're referring to the interest that we pay on our Canadian loans as a tax shield in the U.S.? Yes, that's correct. Yes, you can actually use it as a tax shield in the U.S., yes. Because I think from what I read today, literally, is you, uh, U.S. wants you to, to report your global income, your, your global assets. So theoretically, your assets and your debts, I'm assuming. So that's why I'm going to go ahead and report my Canadian loans as a, as a as my debts per se, and use that as a tax shield. From what I remember, you can report only up to two thousand five hundred dollars though of 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 loan interest. So it's not exactly everything, but it's something. You know, it can kind of help a little bit. That's an excellent point. Thanks for that, Amit. Um, now, in terms of how did, how did you prepare for an away or elective rotation with the goal of asking for a letter of recommendation? Does anybody want to take that? Either Ravi, Amit, or Lucas? Um, so with getting a letter of rec, whether it's for an away or for one of your core rotations, you got to kind of go in the same mindset. You have to, uh, you have to be like, take initiative, you know, you can't just be like sitting around, you have to be, you know, first one there, last one out, you have to, you know, do your homework on things, look up, look up things and, you know, impress the attending or the residents that you're working with. If you're not getting a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one time with the attendings, it's all right, uh, like if you're working mostly with residents, just talk to the residents and see if uh, sometimes they'll have the attending co-sign letter of rec or the attending will just sign the letter of rec as them although the resident will write it and they're uh, you know because they know more about how your performance was um, but you just need to you should work hard and uh, then you just need to ask your attending or your resident team at the end that you want a letter of rec um, with the ways like it, it's really important during your course in third year you're also getting letters of recommendation because when it comes to a ways time, by the time you get a letter of reckon, you're already applying for uh, residency, and you don't want to not have uh, letters, and that holds back like your application. It's not complete for residency. Um, the only uh, caveat is for ER, they have like uh, standardized letters, 
And I think Amit is familiar with those, so I'll let him uh, comment with it on that. All right, so letters of rec. So the idea is when you go on an audition, everyone kind of knows you're there for a letter of rec. You know, like you're not there for fun kind of an idea. So what, you, what do you do? So when you go on your audition, you get there early, you leave late. You know, you kind of know every answer to every question. How do you know what the attendee's going to ask you? You pray to God you know the answer. That's kind of how it works out. So um, how do you go about like actually asking? You'll notice as you go through your rotations, you'll kind of like uh, bond with some attendings. Like you'll kind of have like this this connection per se. I'm like, I know it sounds really cheesy, but it actually really works in real life. Like you'll just notice like you guys like just seem to bond together. Like they're more like like they're more outgoing with the team and stuff like that. Um, so you kind of do that, and then so in regards to the ER, ER has something called the standards, the slow. They're called slowies, whatever whatever the um, acronym stands for. This is actually a standardized letter form. So the idea, like, it's, it's available online. You can look at it. And, like, what happens is the program director or somebody will actually go ahead and, like, and, like rank you based on the number of, of, of previous students that they've seen and so on and so forth. A slow always has to be done at an academic institution or somewhere, well, uh, somewhere with a residency program is, is a better term for it. So make sure if you're going to ER, there's a lot of nuances. Like, I highly recommend you get on all, on all the EM sites and actually read about it. Um, other, pro, um, in terms of internal medicine, not so, they're not that stringent. You kind of want to have, for me at least, I thought I, I had two internal medicine letters and one general surgery letter. I felt like that kind of was sufficient just to show like the broad, the, the broad scope of everything. But anyways, I'm digressing, so I'll let other people go ahead and talk. The only thing I would add to it is when I when I went on auditions and also for rotations in Canada, I would I would approach the attending at the beginning and I would mention, hey, um, I, I'm interested in obtaining a letter as well. Um, feel free to to evaluate me, sort of observe me as much as you need to. Um, and I think that that sort of gives them a heads up as well because sometimes they're they're so busy throughout the day that might not realize that you know you're on an audition as well. Um, so that can kind of give them a heads up as well. So so school, think, oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Uh, okay, so we're going to take one of the questions from YouTube now, um, and it's regard to the MCCEE. The question is, the Ontario FM programs had an M MCCEE cutoff of 324. Do you know if this cutoff will change, and does it, do you have to meet uh, that score otherwise, or to have your application read or be considered at all? So is, is it a hard cutoff, and is the cutoff going to change? Does anybody have anything to add to that? So I can um, answer that to, to a certain degree. I'm not sure if it'll change this year. That's what it was when I applied. And as far as I understand, it is a hard cutoff. If you're below that, most likely your application will not be read. OK. And sorry, Dr. Fiddler, where, did you want to add something to that? No, just to echo that, because Um, so we'll go back to one of the questions uh, from our the form online now. And so one of the questions is: Do any of you did you, did any of you have Canadian classmates who failed to match? And if they if so, what were they? What could they have done in order to improve their uh, chances for the following year? So do you, do any of you know a Canadian who's failed to match? Uh, as far as I know, we've had a hundred percent match rate uh, for the past few years. So for us, I suppose. Now, does having US citizenship boost chances at getting residency, competitive residencies in the US? I would suppose that it does, since you, don't, you aren't restricted by any of those H-1B or J-1 programs. So increases the number of, of hospitals and programs that you can apply to. Um, but did anybody want to add to that at all? Um, yeah, so the first one, uh, all the Canadians in my class matched, uh, and they've done so as long as I've known. Um, and then if you're a U.S. citizen, then a lot of these things don't really apply to you. It only is difficult, like, you, these only matter if you're trying to go match into Canada, like, uh, 
Dennis had to. He had to, you know, take the Canadian boards and stuff. But if you're a U.S. citizen or a green card holder, you're equivalent to all your American counterparts, and you don't need to worry about any visa. Opens up uh, a lot of doors for you, and a number of programs can apply to. So you'll be on even footing with your American classmates for American residencies. Okay. So we have a follow-up for the MCCEE question. Uh, if we could just go back to that topic for a second. Um, it says, if one participates in the second iteration of CARMS but has an MCCEE below 324, do they then look at you at all? I haven't quite answered to that. I can try to answer a little bit. Uh, with the second iteration, I think everything is together, meaning all the positions, both IMG positions and non-IMG positions, are kind of thrown into this one, one group. And then I think it's program specific at that point. Um, the chances of matching are still not very high, especially if you are a DO from, from the US. Uh, you're, you're, that's, I, I wouldn't really look at that as a backup plan at all. Um, just looking at the past few years for, for both IMGs and even Canadians who go through that, that second iteration, it's, it's pretty hard to match. Thanks, thanks so much for that, Lucas. Now, uh, one of our last questions from Austin was, how does transitioning to a fellowship work from an IM residency? And do you have to, is it required for you to sign a waiver at that point when you are transitioning to a fellowship? Or do you sign the waiver at the end of the fellowship? So I suppose, in terms of your visa status, how does that work uh, when you are transitioning to a fellowship from an IM residency? Uh, I'll, I'll let uh, either Ravi or I'm gonna take that. Um, all right, so let me just read the question real quick. If it, how does it work? Better? Oh, so you will always serve, okay, so the idea is you'll get your J-1, you'll get your J-1 visa for your IM residency. Then, uh, let's just say you were from China and you got uh, another, J another statement of need for your fellowship, you will you will continue on your J one up until you finish your J one term. That's when you have to. That's when you have to serve your your out of country requirement or your waiver. So it's at the end of your J one term. So whenever you choose to terminate your J one visa, is when you will go ahead and serve your two year home home requirement. So if that's after fellowship, then so be it. If it's after internal medicine, then so be it. Um, and they. Key point is you're gonna need to do your fellowship on a J-1. You can't switch and do a H-1B. You would have to complete your two-year uh, requirement first and then you could switch to a different type of visa. So if you're able to get your fellowship on a J-1, then you can do it straight through and then do your J-1 term after. But you won't be able to switch at between uh, fellowships or anything like that or say if you get married or something during your J1 residency um, it's still you still have to do your two-year requirement even if you you know you get married to an American citizen or anything like that you can't just switch and like not need a visa for your fellowship or do it on H1B okay. Okay, so we'll go to quite, we're, we're finished with the questions uh, from online now, so we'll go to the questions that are left on the YouTube uh, page. Thank you to everyone who has been participating and watching and also sending in some questions. Um, what are your opinions on specialties like ENT, DERM, OPTHO? Um, have there been Canadian DOs who have matched into these competitive residencies? And if they did, what were some of the key factors that allowed them to match? We've had some pretty incredible matches in the past. I think last year, I think we had somebody in radiation oncology. Um, so we have had some incredible matches. To add to that. Um, so yeah, it's it's definitely more difficult. Well, just in general, matching to any of those competitive specialties like ortho, derm, opto, radiation oncology is is difficult, even for the Americans. Um, and so you just keep in mind, being a Canadian adds one more step or like a little bit more difficulty to that. Um, the most important thing with any of these competitive specialties is going to be board scores. And so you need to do really, really well on boards. For these competitive specialties, you're going to need research. And you're going to need to, you know, 
probably audition at these places and blow them away and uh, get it. So it's just with you're gonna just have to work slightly more harder than your M your American counterpart who's going for the same thing. And then keep in mind these are mostly ACGME programs. So you have two biases going against you. You have a DO bias and then you have your non-American citizen bias. So those are things you have to overcome. So you're gonna have to work harder. I don't know how to like quantify that, but you're gonna just you're gonna need to. That being said, if you really, really, really want to try for those, do it. But just know that the people that did it, they're exceptional individuals and they've had to work hard and it was like it's not like something that's really easy to do. So but if you put in the work it's possible. But it's not something you should like bank on. You definitely need to have a backup plan. Uh, going into any of these competitive specialties. Yeah, the, the only. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Lucas. No problem. Sorry, the the only thing I wanted to add to that is um, the way a good way to kind of think about it is is you're applying for a job, uh, essentially. You know where you're going to have to you're going to be paid for this and and you're going to be learning as well, but um, you have to really show something to a program that's going that's going to make them think that you're worthwhile investment in the sense that they're going to have to go above and beyond an american applicant where they will have to get to give you a visa and deal with sort of the uncertainties that are that our current political climate is going through right so i think you definitely have to be exceptional so i just wanted to echo that as well uh, for any of those uh, specific specialties ent derm uh, radiation oncology you know when you're starting med school you, if, if that's what you want to do, you kind of have to start focusing on that from day one uh, to really have, have a chance to match those. For that, I kind of, here's my two cents. The, the idea of being a DO, you're kind of, it's kind of ingrained in the DO, like, um, structure, you say, like, you're kind of more primary care oriented. If you really want to do those kind of specialties, you might be better off going to an MD school. Just because they have the resources and the ability to help you get there, like I feel like DO schools are a little more geared towards primary care. They help you get towards that goal. While if you want to do ENT, ortho, or things like that, like don't get me wrong, it's very possible to do it. It's just you have to put in the legwork for it, and it's going to be a little bit harder for you. Also, you got to remember, like a lot of DOs are only in the primary care field. Yes, there are a couple out there, but it'll be a bit harder for you because there'll be a bit of a bias for sure. And out of like a pool of MDs, you'll be the only DO there on your interview day. So you kind of have to watch out for that kind of stuff. Again, board scores are hard, like there's all the, you have to get a higher board score. So I feel, again, there'll be AC gym, so you have to get a higher USMLE board score on top of that. So I feel like going to an MD school prepare you to get that higher USMLE score per se. Like not to say DO schools don't prepare you for USMLE, but you just need to get that extra level in there that you kind of need that little bit of help per se to get those specialties. And also, I feel with an MD school, you'll be able to, I guess you can also kind of pull this off in your fourth year. You'll get your auditions a lot easier. You'll kind of have like an ENT, like an uh, ENT department that could kind of call other departments and kind, of, and kind of help you through the process of actually getting an ENT, like residency and so on and so forth. Well, that's kind of my kind of my opinion. You need to do research. You're going to need to look like an MD applicant, literally, as much as you can in order for you to get one of these competitive specialties. And the fact that visa, so you're probably not going to get an H-1B ENT spot. Like, it's it's going to be pretty hard for you to do that. But, so I feel like you have to be willing to go for the J-1 at that point in time because there's just not going to be that many places because they, they can they don't need to they don't need to put split in a couple thousand dollars in you in order to fill that spot. There's already a couple a hundred to about thousands of applicants right for that spot on a J1. So it's going to be a bit harder for you. So if you want to do it, go for it, but make sure you've done your homework and be ready for it. You know, you got to, when you, when you stay one, as Lucas said, if you're coming to med school for that, you make sure on day one, you're, you're ready to go for it. That's, yep. I think uh, everyone here made some incredible points. Um, something I'd like to add as well is deal schools are primarily like the student affairs departments are primarily uh, geared towards students matching into primary care fields. Um, if you want to go into a specialty, you really will, even um, the American residents have to do a lot of the legwork um, uh, themselves. So that's, uh, in terms of what the school can provide for you, you have to consider that as well. And that's just another reason 
why you would want to perhaps go to an MD school if you want to do some of those competitive uh, specialties. Um, so we have a question. Um, how competitive is it to attain a family medicine, family residence, family medicine residency position with an H-1B program uh, versus an IM? I'm supposing with just with an H-1B. So I just want to have an idea of how attainable an H-1B is. So do, do any of you guys want to take that? Either Ravi or uh, all right. I'll go ahead first. So um, it all depends more on. So the competitiveness isn't really the kind of, okay, family medicine is slightly less competitive, so it would be theoretically less easy, it would be easier for you to get, but the idea comes down to the quality of the program. You want a more quality, you want a better quality education, so that's kind of what I ask someone to seek more than just actually, hey, which one is easier, and as I, I already alluded, like, the fact is because more people want to go into internal medicine just because of whatever the reason is per se. So I would say an internal medicine would be slightly harder, but still very cheap. Because I want to say like if you look at the at the CARM, I mean at this at the at the stats data, I want to see there are almost equal amounts of physicians in both fields. And almost they if one if the internal medicine program at one hospital offers the H one B, the family medicine generally does as well. So I don't really feel like there'll be that much of a difference. It's just kind of how you want to approach it. Like yeah, here's how I thought about it through, actually. Family medicine teaches you based more on the population demographics, pediatrics, OB, so on and so forth. While internal medicine teaches you the kidneys, the heart, uh, neuro, so on and so forth. So it kind of depends on how you want to learn things per se. So like I kind of prefer learning through like like through the systems basis. That's why I went down the internal medicine route, and it also opened up fellowship opportunities per se. It all depends on what career goals you want to do. And what you want to do. So that's kind of how I'd see it being better than more, like which is more competitive, less competitive. I'd say they're equal in competitiveness, if not families, slightly easier, like marginally easier. Yeah. And then I just want to add in for getting the, the, the more desirable visa, it depends on how competitive you are as an applicant too. So the better you boost your your competitive competitiveness, your board scores, your extracurriculars, your you know, your application it's going to make you more competitive um, and so again if you're you know an average applicant it might be a little more difficult for you to get the h1b if you're you know you do you could do a little better on your boards and things like that and you have these other intangibles you do auditions at places where they know you that gives you a higher probability of matching at those places that you want so there's, there's always you know those ways to make it slightly uh, more attainable for you to get the more desired visa. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for uh, that. Um, I think those are the, all the questions that we had. We've uh, touched all the questions on YouTube that were submitted. Thank you to everyone who did that. Um, and also, from around, was there anything um, that... I think we may have missed one, actually. Um, the question was, I know that statements of needs from Canada require ACGME approved residency with the merger happening. Does that mean AOA residencies are fair game now too? So, okay, so I go to, I match through the AOA map, uh, but my place is dual accredited. Um, and so the thing with the statement of need is they're gonna need an ACGME uh, sort of like uh, the number they got to look it up in their database that's all they care about um, so with the AOA programs they would need to at least they would need to have their ACGME initial accreditation so that they're able to be in the database uh, right now it's kind of like the infancy of this merger thing so no one's actually tried or I don't think anyone's obtained with a place that has initial credit uh, initial accreditation my program's been dual accredited for about five or six years already, so I won't be the test subject on that. But if uh, this year or the next years, if somebody goes to a historically AOA program that has initial accreditation and they go through the J1 process, that'll be kind of the end confirmation. But from my understanding is once they, if they have the initial AC Dreamy accreditation, they're under that AC Dreamy umbrella and it should meet all the requirements. But until we actually test it through, it's kind of hard to say 100% sure. But I'm fairly confident that that would suffice. 
Um, I want to mirror what Ravi says. So the idea is you got to remember once a program with ACGME accredited, it's fine. It's under the ACGME umbrella, so you so you don't have to worry too much. So just a quick like a little. There's pre-accredited. There's and then there's going to be there's one uh, up the people that are applying for accredited, pre-accredited, and initial accreditation. So when you're applying, make sure you have someone that has an initial accreditation because that has an ACGME number. And you can submit that to, to Health Canada, and Health Canada will issue you a statement of need. Also, whenever they have initial accreditation, they get bumped from the AOA, AOA ERAS into the, a, the ACGME ERAS. So that's kind of like a little filter for you, per se, if you're in the process of the application for the, for the current third year. The third year is going to fourth years right now. Uh, okay, well, thank you so much for that. And so I think now we've hit all the questions. Um, thank you everyone for tuning in and also thank you to all the physicians who came to join us. Um, before we leave, did any of you want to have some final words, uh, things that we didn't touch on or any pieces of advice for everyone watching? Uh, Amit, why don't we start with you? Um, okay, I guess I'll just go for every year. For the pre-meds, getting to med school, that's kind of like the most important thing before any of this stuff actually matters. Be a well rounded applicant, be nice on your interviews. That's kind of what they look for. For MS1s, get used to eat, drinking from a fire hose. That's pretty much what med school is. Once you're there, just drink through it, because second year comes, we have to learn how to drink from a fire hose and study for boards. Second years, study for boards as hard as you can, because that stuff is the greatest thing in the world. Once you're done with that, it's the greatest feeling. Third years, uh, learn on your rotations, be nice. Be kind to your nurses, of course. That's what they always drill on. It's really important because the more you know in third year, the better you look in fourth year, and and that way you'll get your audition. I mean, that way you'll get your letters of reckon and so on and so forth. Fourth years, it's a great time, guys. I just add it uh, with, from like uh, September to like November, November. It's pretty stressful, but January is coming, and January is a great time. From January to like till the end to match is a great time. So have fun. It's the end of the road. Residency, I'll tell you guys when I get there, but I think that's about it. Dr. Fidler, why don't you go on now? Uh, just to comment on everything you said, exactly. I drink from the fire hose and try to remember stuff because at the end of the day, it actually does matter. Um, I'm better at the aspect of coming back to Canada, so just reiterate on that. Make sure that you have your timeline organized for your exam if you want to come back. Everything is very meticulous, it's very organized. There's lots of information online. So, if that, uh, if, if you're getting in that third and fourth year spot, start uh, looking to that if you're going to come back to Canada. The other thing is, enjoy it because once you get out here, you have to make real decisions on real people. That's a big deal. You guys are going to love it. Awesome. Uh, Chris, how about yourself? So, you know, I definitely agree with everything said so far. Uh, the one thing that, that I would add as, as advice for anyone in med school is, you know, whenever you have a situation where you feel down or you you kind of hit a bit of a brick wall, try to gain a little bit of perspective and try to go back and think about why you've decided to go to med school in the first place, why you're pursuing this. And I think um, when, you, when you get to that, to that point, that can help you kind of motivate you to, to, to move forward because sometimes through med school, as, as you go on, you can kind of lose sight of that because you have all these different things, all these uh, requirements to meet and all these priorities that uh, sometimes it can get too much. So I think um, that's uh, what, I would, what I would give as advice. Sorry about uh, that. All right. And then uh, my part, uh, I would just kind of reiterate with Lucas is it's, you know, med medical school is going to be really stressful. There's going to be a lot of challenges. Important thing is to have a good balance. Make sure you make time for yourself. Uh, make sure you you know make time to have fun. You're not going to be able to have fun every weekend, but when you have those opportunities, take advantage of it. Um, and I can reiterate what um, Amit said: is the fourth year is by far like the best year of med school. Um, first of all, you feel more confident. You actually have medical knowledge. You're getting more opportunities to actually make uh, decisions in patient care. So you feel like more like a doctor. This is more kind of like what you're going to be doing. And you tend to be doing ro uh, rotations in the field you're interested in. So you get there. And then also once after match, you have no stress. You get, get a little bit more free time. 
you guys should get some time to maybe travel, relax, do things like that. Um, and so just if you're in one of those first three years and you're kind of burning out, just know that fourth year is coming and it's going to be better and you'll, it'll be, it'll be fun and you'll get some time to kind of recover before uh, you start residency. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone who is tuning in and for all the physicians who participated. This brings us uh, to the end of the hour um, and our chat, and hopefully we'll get to do some of these uh, once more, a uh, few more times. Uh, thank you to everyone, um, and I hope you have a wonderful day.